While the contamination sites are all very different, one thing was common, the presence of lead impacted children. We used a portable lead care kit, which uses a fingerprint and gives the results in minutes. And let me tell you, it was heart-wrenching as the child is still sitting there before you as the results come on the screen. Parents or grandparents would bring their kids out of their homes asking why they are somewhat slow in school relative to the other children. So even though you might not be able to see the lead contamination at these sites, the impact to the children is very evident. My name's Gordon Benkhorst. I'm a contaminant hydrogeologist, and I've spent my career investigating and cleaning up contaminated waste sites, predominantly in the United States. In the past 10 years or so, I've also done this work in lower middle income countries around the world through the nonprofit Pure Earth. I've investigated dozens of sites and completed cleanup or risk mitigation projects in countries such as Bangladesh, the Philippines, and Zambia. Our efforts have identified and raised awareness about contaminated sites, and our cleanup efforts have mitigated exposure to toxic contamination, improving the health outcome of children in those areas. At Pure Earth, we work at the intersection of environment and health. We prioritize investigating sites where human health is at risk and where we know children and pregnant women are being exposed to harmful toxins. Our teams carry out both environmental site assessments and health assessments and craft solutions to address both types of impacts. Our environment gets contaminated from both point sources and non-point sources. Examples of non-point sources are stormwater runoff, acid rain, or runoff from agricultural sites containing pesticides and fertilizers. Point sources can include industrial sites, electronic waste processing facilities, mining facilities, and waste dump sites. Each of these examples can include different contaminants, like mercury from artisanal gold mining or various petroleum products from underground tanks, dioxins, furons, uh, the list goes on and on. Another important source is the recycling of lead-acid batteries, largely from cars, trucks, and e-rickshaws. Battery recycling operations in lower and middle-income countries typically range from backyard recycling with open pit smelting to substandard formal recycling facilities with poor emission controls. Both tend to spew toxic lead into the air that gets deposited in soil, on crops, and dust in people's homes. Environmental contamination can impact our soil, groundwater, surface water, and air, and usually a combination of all of these. The parts of our environment that are contaminated and what they're contaminated with generally determines how humans can be exposed and what the potential impacts might be. When we investigate a contaminated site, it's important to realize that every site is different. They have different contaminants, different geology, different histories. One looks at a site contaminated with mercury from artisanal gold mining very differently from a site with contaminated lead from informal battery recycling, for example. We also employ different investigative tools. For instance, use of a portable XRF might be suitable for screening of surficial metals at ground surface and soil, whereas collection of deeper soil and groundwater samples for testing in a laboratory would be more appropriate for a gasoline spill. Each site investigation has to consider the contaminants of concern, how they were released into the environment, how these contaminants behave in the environment over time, and the physical characteristics of the site, things like geology and depth to groundwater. Site investigations also identify human and ecological receptors, pertinent regulations, and risk-based cleanup goals. A thorough and high-quality investigation of a contaminated site is extremely important to guide the effective cleanup or risk mitigation work. In order to clean up a site, we have to fully investigate and understand the site, its contaminant distribution, and its environmental and human health risks. And to clarify, when we talk about cleaning up sites, we must differentiate between remediation and risk mitigation. Remediation may include techniques like excavation and off-site disposal of contaminated soil or chemical and biological treatment of soil, for example, techniques that are typically considered more permanent. Risk mitigation techniques, on the other hand, are used to reduce the exposure to contamination and are often more cost-effective than cleanup. 
Risk mitigation techniques may include things like capping of contaminated soil with clean soil, prohibiting use of groundwater for drinking water purposes, or simply fencing in a contaminated site to restrict access. We must consider a number of factors when selecting remediation or risk mitigation techniques that would be appropriate for a site. Such factors include things like available resources, cost, technical feasibility, effectiveness, public acceptance, and long-term sustainability. Whatever we do select, we can always evaluate the effectiveness of our remediation or risk mitigation work through blood lead level monitoring, both before and after the work has been completed. The effectiveness of our cleanup or risk mitigation work can also be evaluated through routine inspections of the site to check things like soil concentrations of lead or to make sure the restrictive fencing or the capping elements are still in place. Note that most cleanups are risk-based. Typically, cleanups do not return the environment to a pristine condition, but to some acceptable level of risk. Regulatory and health agencies have developed risk-based cleanup standards for most contaminants in different media, be it soil, groundwater, or surface water. For instance, the US EPA currently uses a lead concentration of 200 parts per million in soil for lead as an acceptable level for children in play areas. This is an example of a risk-based cleanup standard. The vast majority of cleanup work or risk mitigation work utilizes such risk-based standards in evaluating options to address environmental contamination and potential human impacts. It's very difficult to prescribe a certain cleanup or risk mitigation strategy without a complete site investigation, as each site is very different. Thus, certain types of sites share characteristics which may be more amenable to certain strategies. For instance, an informal battery recycling site with open pit smelting typically includes very shallow contamination spread over a very large area through atmospheric deposition during smelting. We can clean up such a site by scraping the superficial soil for off-site handling, for example, while addressing other potential exposure routes like groundwater or impacted crops by other means. Other sites with deeper contamination might warrant risk mitigation instead of cleanup, depending on logistics and available resources. Such risk mitigation can include capping with a geotextile and clean soil to mitigate direct exposure risk, along with long-term monitoring and maintenance plan to ensure sustainability. Addressing sites with contaminated groundwater might also include restricting use of the groundwater in the area for drinking water purposes, along with provision of an alternate potable water source like a deeper community well. There are already many contaminated sites around the world, and while there has been much improvement, we are still finding and creating more. Once a site is contaminated, the remedies can be difficult and expensive. Accordingly, prevention of new sites is really important. Tools like regulations, monitoring, awareness raising, health monitoring, and enforcement all have their place in reducing the creation of additional contaminated sites, as well as cleaning up already contaminated ones. Governments, the private sector, civil society groups all play an important part. Awareness and education is critical. An informed public can recognize what polluters are doing and can take action to protect themselves, their children, and their communities. From Pure Earth's work across 50 lower and middle income countries over the past two decades, we have learned that most people are not aware of the dangers of toxins like lead and mercury. Once they do understand the health risks, especially to their children, they become powerful protective advocates and can drive polluters away in some cases. An informed public can also pressure government agencies to take action to regulate industry and prompt cleanup or risk mitigation at sites. For already contaminated sites, it's important to note that remediation should be the responsibility of the owner, the so-called polluter pays principle. Although in practice, this doesn't always work out well as the polluter has either abandoned the site or has gone bankrupt. I have focused on contaminated sites today. However, there are many exposure sources to lead, including lead adulterated spices, food cooked in aluminum cookware, lead containing foods, ceramics, soil contamination, toys, cosmetics. Unfortunately, the list goes on. The sources of lead exposure and their various contributions to elevated blood lead levels in children is highly variable. 